one of the potential consequences of the administration rescinding these memos is that it's going to disrupt the above-ground regulated marijuana market. Does anybody have any knowledge or any evidence that these businesses in Colorado and Washington have shuttered their doors since last week? I mean, if that were true, then they would have shut down. They haven't shut down. They're still going. Welcome to the award-winning podcast, Lawyer to Lawyer, with J. Craig Williams and Robert Ambrosi. Bringing you the latest legal news and observations with the leading experts in the legal profession. You're listening to Legal Talk Network. Welcome to Lawyer to Lawyer on the Legal Talk Network. I'm Craig Williams coming to you from a rainy Southern California. I write a legal blog called May It Please the Court and have a book out called How to Get Sued. My co-host Bob Ambrosi is out today. And before we introduce today's topic, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Clio and Latera. Clio is a cloud-based practice management software that makes it easy to manage your law firm from intake to invoice. You can try it for free at Clio.com. That's C-L-I-O.com. And Latera, Latera is the authority on document creation, collaboration, and control. You can increase your productivity, collaborate securely, and ensure protection of your vital information. Learn more at www.latera.com. Well, on January 4th, 2018, this year, Attorney General Jeff Sessions rescinded a key Obama-era policy that allowed states to regulate their own legal marijuana. This announcement came days after the new legalization measure for recreational marijuana took effect in California. While many states have decriminalized or legalized marijuana use, the drug is still illegal under federal law. But today on Lawyer to Lawyer, we're going to discuss Attorney General Jeff Sessions' efforts to rescind the Department of Justice's Cole memo towards state legal marijuana and the impact on state law that has had that has marijuana legislation and how this announcement will impact marijuana litigation and the marijuana business. So joining us today is returning guest Paul Armentano. Paul is Deputy Director of Normal, which is the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. And he's a senior policy advisor at Freedom Leaf, Inc., the marijuana legalization company. He's the co-author of the book, Marijuana is Safer, So Why Are We Driving People to Drink? Welcome to the show, Paul Armentano. It's good to be here, Craig. Thank you for having me. And our next guest is Paul Larkin. He is the senior legal research fellow for the Heritage Foundation's Mies Center for Legal Injustice and Judicial Studies. In 1996-1997, Mr. Larkin served as the counsel for the Senate Judiciary Committee and head of the crime unit for Senator Orrin Hatch, who is then the panel's chairman. He's written about today's topic for the Heritage Foundation. Welcome to the show, Paul Larkin. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, Paul Armentano, let's start with you. Can you give a, a quick summary of the Cole memo and what it is that Attorney General Sessions has just done? Sure. Well, let's be clear. The Attorney General on Thursday didn't just rescind the Cole memo. He rescinded all Obama-era memos that had to do with marijuana policy and marijuana law enforcement. Uh, this included memos with regard to banking, memos with regard to medical marijuana, and indeed the coal memo. Now, the coal memo specifically said this. It essentially was a guidance memo to U.S. attorneys that said it was the preference of the administration that they took a largely hands-off approach to federal prosecution of those individuals who were compliant with the marijuana laws of their states. And as long as those individuals and operators were engaged in activities that were not violating specified federal priorities, like, for instance, cultivating cannabis on federal land or exporting marijuana from legal states to other states where marijuana uh, remains illicit, then the federal government was largely content to let those operations engage in those activities in a regulated manner. By rescinding this memo, 
the Justice Department is largely uh, continuing or even increasing a level of uncertainty uh, that now exists within this industry and is emphasizing uh, this state and federal conflict that continues to exist. So, Paul Larkin, a number of states, 29 in all, have adopted medical marijuana laws, seven of which have uh, allowed by legislation voted in by the people recreational marijuana. So how does the state's rights issues play into the Constitution with respect to the current change that we're hearing about from the Department of Justice? For more than a century now, we have decided that we're not going to make medical decisions, particularly involving pharmaceuticals by plebiscite. The Pure Food and Drug Act of 1908 recognized that there was an important need to have uniformity across the land in what was and was not a safe medication. Certainly since the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act of 1938, uh, we have had the same determination. In fact, since 1960 or the early 60s, not only is the FDA responsible for measuring the safety of a drug, but determining its effectiveness. In other words, for quite some time now, we have consistently decided that the pharmaceutical, the biochemical, and the medical questions involved in what drugs are safe and effective are not subject to a vote. We've left them to the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Association. So the idea that the state somehow has the right to decide what drugs it is going to be able to do, allowed to be distributed to its people flies in the face of 110 years of history. Paul Armentano, what's your take on states' rights versus uh, the medical marijuana issue that the federal government's taking right now? Well, first, let me say it's a bit hard to fathom that that a group like the Heritage Foundation that proclaims to be based upon the principles of free enterprise, limited government, and individual freedom would support a move by the administration that undermines all three of those principles. Uh, In reality, marijuana is illegal federally because it was classified by members of Congress in 1970 as a Schedule I prohibited substance which means by definition, Congress says that cannabis possesses the highest potential for abuse of any controlled substance available, that it is so unsafe for human consumption that it could not be administered safely even within a hospital setting, and that it has no accepted medical use in the United States. Outside of Congress, uh, the American people don't believe that that decision passes the smell test anymore. And while this reversal by the Attorney General may further some uncertainty in the short term, it does very little in the long term to alter the progress and momentum that we are having at the state and local level. In fact, just 24 hours after the administration made this decision, the House of Representatives in the state of Vermont voted to legalize the possession and cultivation of marijuana by adults. And in Oklahoma, Governor Mary Fallon announced that in June, the um, public of Oklahoma will be deciding on the issue of medical marijuana in that state. So clearly our momentum is continuing to move forward. Paul Arkin, is it is it a decision of the Congress or was it a decision of the Food and Drug Administration, as you've indicated, that we're relying on? How did it get listed as a Schedule One narcotic? That was a decision that was made by Congress in 1970, not the FDA. Well, let's take a look at how these Obama-era policies have come into play. Is, is this uh, and, and Sessions' announcement to terminate this? Paul Arkin, is, it, is Trump essentially turning over every Obama rule and regulation that he can find? And is this part of that? Or is this a concentrated effort to take on the states and battle out the issue of who gets to regulate marijuana? President Trump hasn't said anything, to my knowledge, since the attorney general made his announcement on Thursday. It's unlikely the attorney general made that without first telling people in the White House. That's not the sort of decision you make without telling the people in the, in the latter facility about what's going on. But the, the fact that the President Trump has been quiet may simply mean he's waiting to see what happens. It's not uncommon for politicians to let others make decisions and then see if it's favorable, they'll join on. If it's unfavorable, they'll oppose it. 
Congress has been doing that for quite some time, in fact, ever since 1996. Marijuana is illegal under federal law, but many states have decided they want to have a medical marijuana program or now a recreational marijuana program. Congress hasn't re-examined the issue and said, no, you shouldn't be allowed to do that. In fact, it's very possible that at least in some of the states, the reason they adopted these measures is they thought they would be struck down under federal law, which therefore would allow the politicians in each state to claim that they got a benefit for their state yet it's entirely cost-free to them because federal law is going to strike it down. So the fact that there are a lot of states have done this in the teeth of a federal statute that is unquestionably constitutional is not in any way an indication that there is a long-standing or now long-standing opposition to federal law. Plus, to the extent the public knows about this problem, they may not be fully aware of all the risks. After all, marijuana was first outlawed under federal law in 1937 when FDR was president, and the Controlled Substances Act of 1970 was passed when Richard Nixon was president. Well, guess what? Science has advanced a great deal since then, and there is more evidence now that long-term marijuana use is harmful than there was before. One of the benefits, if perhaps not the principal benefit of what the Attorney General did last week, is make this an issue that Congress now has to debate, because that's where this debate should be conducted, with the advice of the Food and Drug Administration. Paul Armentano, is that uh, where this is going to play out in Congress, or is it going to play out in the courts? Where do we see this state's right issue hitting? Well, I do agree that this move by the Attorney General's office may uh, create a sense of urgency among members of Congress who in the past did seem content to sort of let this untenable divide between the state laws and the federal laws uh, simply coexist. Uh, It is clear that that cannot go on indefinitely. And there are now multiple bills pending in Congress, in both the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate, that would rectify this issue, that would explicitly and once and for all say that marijuana policy and the decision whether or not to regulate the adult use of marijuana or the medical use of marijuana is a decision that is left solely up to the discrimination of the individual states. So certainly we think it would be a positive if one of the consequences of this change in these Obama-era policies is to kickstart members of Congress from revisiting this issue. As Paul said, this is an issue that frankly should have been revisited quite a long time ago. And for whatever reason, members of Congress have been hesitant to do so, despite the fact that 64% of Americans now say marijuana ought to be legal for adults. Over 90% of Americans say that medical marijuana ought to be legal. And 75% of Americans say that regardless of how they feel about marijuana. This is a decision that ought to be left up to the individual states. Paul Larkin, what do you see the future bringing for us? Does this uh, change, this announcement, mean that there will be more enforcement of pot laws on a federal level? Uh, Here in California, uh, we've just issued approximately 400 permits for businesses to conduct retail marijuana sales and other testing and other other types of operations. How's that going to affect on these businesses that are opening up? Well, I think the attorney general has decided that the best way to try to reconsider the policy is to let people know at the outset that he's reconsidering the policy. I mean, after all, it's far better in a circumstance like we have now after we've had many years in which, you know, effectively the federal government has declined to investigate or prosecute these cases for the attorney general to say first, um, withdrawing or and rescinding all the memos that said that this may be something that the federal government will leave alone. Second, I'm going to give local U.S. attorneys authority to decide how big a problem this is in their district versus other problems. Uh, but third, we're uh, not going to necessarily go down the same road either that the past administrations have or the people fear will take. Will there be some prosecutions? If you have large-scale marijuana trafficking from one state to another, then yes, that's going to happen. In fact, I think uh, Nebraska brought a suit in the Supreme Court of the United States against Colorado, 
saying that effectively Colorado was allowing marijuana to seep over into Nebraska where it's illegal. If you have people trying to buy marijuana in Colorado and then sell it for an even greater profit in Nebraska, the federal government is going to look into that problem and probably bring charges against people because it's illegal in Nebraska and you're transporting stuff from state A to state B in an unlawful manner. So will there be prosecutions? There may. I don't think it's going to happen in the near future because the federal government has now said uh, we have a different policy and they're going to let that sink in. When they'll actually start bringing them, that depends on the facts of each case. Well, before we move on to our next segment, we're going to take a quick break to hear a message from our sponsors. We'll be right back. Documents are the currency of business. They represent you in every business interaction. Executives need to know what changes have occurred in documents, what metadata risks exist, and how to encrypt, share, and collaborate securely. Patera simplifies the document creation and collaboration process to protect you from risk and loss of reputation. Patera offers better solutions for document lifecycle management so you can focus on doing what really matters www.latera.com. Imagine what you could do with an extra eight hours per week. That's how much time legal professionals save with Clio, the world's leading practice management software. With intuitive time tracking, billing, and matter management, Clio streamlines everything you do to run your practice from intake to invoice. Try Clio for free and get a 10% discount for your first six months when you sign up at their website, clio.com, that's C-L-I-O.com, with the code L2L10, that's L2L, the number 10. And welcome back to Lawyer to Lawyer. I'm Craig Williams, and with us today is returning guest Paul Armentano, Deputy Director of Normal, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, and Paul Larkin, Senior Research Fellow for the Heritage Foundation's Mies Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. My co-host, Bob Ambrosi, is off today. We've been discussing Attorney General Jeff Sessions' efforts to rescind the Department of Justice's policy towards state legal marijuana. Paul Armentano, what effect will this have on the businesses that in the 29 states or so that have in one form or another legalized pot? Well, in the short term, it may have very little effect. Uh, these businesses and the individuals involved in these uh, establishments are well aware that marijuana remains illegal under federal law. And the U.S. attorneys, despite uh, the Cole memo and other memos, of course, always had the discretion to go after and prosecute uh, egregious violators of the federal law. Uh, as Paul said earlier, uh, if someone is engaging in behavior where, for instance, they're ex exporting uh, cannabis from a legal state to a state where marijuana remains illegal, uh, those actions were always or have always been uh, prosecutable under federal law. And in fact, the feds have made those sort of prosecutions. So it is not as if uh, rescinding the coal memo uh, suddenly made it open season on these enterprises. Theoretically, they always could be targeted. Some of them have been targeted in the, in the past. We just hope that the U.S. attorneys continue to use sound discretion. And if they go after any players, they target bad actors rather than trying to target both good actors and bad actors to try and send some sort of chilling effect. Paul Larkin, the uh, federal government rules and regulations right now on marijuana prevents the federal banking system from dealing with anybody in the pot business. How do these states and these businesses expect to be able to operate if they can't do any banking? You have to keep in mind that there's two different things going on here. One is uh, the fact that this is an activity that is illegal under federal law, so it's not surprising that the federal government has an interest in making sure that activities that violate federal statutes uh, don't wind up continuing to grow. And secondly, as a practical matter, ironically, uh, one of the ways of keeping businesses small, uh, making it just, say, mom-and-pop stores as opposed to Marijuana Inc., uh, is to not change uh, any of the banking laws. Right now, the people who want to have uh, the banking laws changed probably are people who would like to make a great deal of money in this business. Part of the problem, I think, is 
we've relied too much on private parties to be involved in the distribution of this. I think one way to minimize any of the harms from this is to follow the model that we now have in the alcoholic beverage area. States like Virginia have ABC stores, alcoholic beverage control stores. They are the ones who are responsible for the distribution of distilled spirits. You can buy beer and wine at a grocery store, but if you want whiskey, you have to get it at an ABC store. That might eliminate some of the problems that are result from having large-scale commercial distribution of marijuana, but I don't even see anybody discussing that issue. And maybe one of the benefits of what happened last week is people will now have to address that issue. Paul Armitano, what's your take on the banking law issue? Uh, well, clearly, again, it speaks to this conflict between uh, state and federal law, and it really undermines, I think, the goal of uh, the majority of the public and, and many state and local politicians that want to see these commercial activities regulated. Uh, they want that outcome because they want these commercial activities to be transparent, to have these transactions be taxed, and to have the proprietors involved be state-licensed businesses. They understand that that kind of regulated above-ground market is preferable to driving these activities back to the underground market, where the primary players in these, in these behaviors are drug dealers and cartels. And what's really frustrating is that one of the potential consequences of the administration rescinding these memos is that it's not going to disrupt the marijuana market. It's going to disrupt the above-ground regulated marijuana market, and it's going to drive these activities back into the shadows. And that's simply not a preferable outcome to most Americans. Can I can I ask one question in that regard? Jump in. Does anybody have any knowledge or any evidence that these businesses in Colorado and Washington have shuttered their doors since last week? I mean, if that were true, then they would have shut down. They haven't shut down. They're still going. You may not see as many people invest in future businesses, but if the businesses are still selling today, they're going to still sell tomorrow uh, unless and until the government – brings criminal prosecutions, I suppose. And as I said earlier, Paul, in response to one of the initial questions, I said, you know, the short-term impact of this so far remains to be seen because many of these players, if not all of these players, are certainly aware that their activities are in violation of federal law. But again, if the purpose of this memo is to create uncertainty and to potentially create a chilling effect by prosecuting one or two or three high-profile players, well, we can certainly guarantee that that is going to thin the market or call the market and may even discourage the state agencies that are regulating these practices and licensing these practices. They may get out of the regulation business altogether, which would it certainly throw the market uh, largely into chaos. Well, Paul Larkin, there's a, been an argument by those in favor of the loosening of pot laws that the federal government ought to be going after the opioid epidemic which is a lot worse, they claim, than whatever dangers that marijuana causes. What's your sense of that kind of age-old argument they should be out catching other criminals? You know, when I hear that argument, what I'm reminded of is the response that then-Senator Obama made to uh, Senator John McCain towards the end of their presidential campaign. When the economy started going south in a big way in 2008, John McCain said, oh, well, maybe we should... Uh, stop the campaign in order to deal with this problem. President Obama responded, you know, a president has to do more things, more than one thing at a time. And so anybody who wants to be president has to be able to do the same. Well, a nation has to be able to deal with more than one problem at a time. And the fact that we have other problems doesn't mean we shouldn't address this one. There are severe concerns about potential long-term harms to adolescents, for example, from marijuana use. We shouldn't drop our concern. We shouldn't forget about the problem. We shouldn't ignore that it's there just because we have another problem going on simultaneously. I would just like to add, I, I, I think regulating marijuana for adults 
putting it behind the counter, making these transactions transparent, licensing businesses to engage in these activities as opposed to relegating uh, these behaviors to black market drug dealers, that is addressing the problem. That is acknowledging that we don't want marijuana, for instance, to get in the hands of young people. It is acknowledging that despite a century of criminalization of cannabis, marijuana is here to stay. It's enjoyed responsibly by tens of millions of Americans. That's why you and I are having this discussion today. That's why eight states have moved to regulate the adult use of marijuana, and 30 states now acknowledge the therapeutic use of cannabis by statute. It's because we want to keep the public safe, and we want to regulate cannabis accordingly, and we recognize that criminalization has failed to do either one. Right now, the states don't sell alcohol to minors either, and yet no minor seems to have any difficulty acquiring it. So are you, are you advocating we, we then uh, no longer have age restrictions for alcohol, or would you acknowledge those are preferable? What I was saying was we prohibit alcohol from being sold to minors, but they can still get it. I grew up in New York City, and if you had the money and weren't wearing diapers, you could buy beer. So the idea that simply because we're regulating a product – Miners won't get a hold of it. It doesn't hold water. Of course it does. Let's look at our history of cigarette use in this country. Cigarette use by young people is at an all-time low, and it has been dropping precipitously for years. That's not because we criminalized or prohibited the adult use of tobacco. It's because we had a common-sense enforcement policy. We regulated it out of the hands of young people, and we had public service announcements that warned young people about the risk of its use. That sort of legalization, regulation, and taxation works far better than criminalization. The Attorney General did us a big favor by saying that these decisions shouldn't be made by the Justice Department. They should be made by Congress in consultation with the FDA. We should thank him for what he did. With respect to trying to compare what happened with cigarettes, etc., well, Cigarette use has gone down among minors because we've been able to explain to them that cigarette use is going to kill them. I'm not saying that marijuana use is going to kill them, but marijuana use on a long-term basis is going to have some serious problems. I think we need to make sure that minors and others are aware of that. And I think we need also to talk more about the associated harms that don't seem to come up in this discussion at all, which is like the problem of drugged driving. It's a terrible problem. We don't see it being discussed in any of the states where they're engaged in legalization debates, and I think it needs to be. I work at the Heritage Foundation, and people could contact me there. Great. And Paul Armentano, your final thoughts and your contact information? Sure. Well, I would just say that, you know, if Jeff Sessions wishes to build a time capsule that will transport him back to the failed drug war policies of the past, he's welcome to try and do so. But the American people have clearly rejected these sort of flat earth policies and arguments, and they've made it clear that they wish to move in a different direction. Now the ball is squarely in the court of Congress. And it is up to them to amend federal law in a manner that comports with the rapidly changing cultural and legal status of marijuana. If your listeners want to join Normal in this fight, they're welcome to look us up online at www.norml.org. Great. Gentlemen, thank you both for being on the show today. You made some excellent topics that are worth a lot of consideration. For our listeners, thank you for listening. And that brings us to the end of our show. If you like what you heard today, please rate us in Apple Podcasts. This is Craig Williams. Thanks for listening. Join us next time for another great legal topic. When you want legal, think lawyer to lawyer. Thanks for listening to Lawyer to Lawyer. Produced by the broadcast professionals at Legal Talk Network. Join J. Craig Williams and Robert Ambrosi for their next podcast covering the latest legal topic. Subscribe to the RSS feed on LegalTalkNetwork.com or in iTunes. 
The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.